so yeah, I do a lot of open source. Over the years, I did over 20 open source projects that are available on my GitHub, and they're used by over 80,000 teams, including those at Apple, Airbnb, Disney. I hope a lot of you use it as well. Um, the thing I'm most known for is Sorcery, but it's actually not the most popular project I have. There are a couple of projects that are cloned way more than Sorcery, uh, like Difference, for example, which I'm going to mention. And I have led the New York Times for over six years. So today, uh, it's going to be interesting because in May, I decided to stop doing full-time gigs for a while and just focus on consulting only. And as I moved into that transition of having more free space and exploring indie work again outside of consulting, trying to find the right balance. I've been working on a lot of different projects, my own projects, but also a lot of client projects. And I started to look at the kind of frameworks, techniques, and workflows that are the same across all of the projects that I work on, regardless of what architecture they're using, whether it's TCA, Swift UI, MVVM, doesn't really matter. I try to find the common points. I'm actually building a video course about this stuff, so today is going to be very dense. We only have half an hour, so I'm going to talk about my favorite things from the whole community of um, Coco. So we'll see uh, some of the tools that you probably use, but some of them I hope will be new to you and you can explore and learn and hopefully make your life a little easier as we go. So. What we're going to cover is project organization, the standard build, well, not standard, but build tools, the workflows around bugs and debugging our application, improving iteration speed, better testing, and some couple of tools that I want to mention that uh, I find useful in day-to-day -day development. So let's start with project organization. So we have a lot of options. The three most common one, we can use Swift Package Manager, we can use CocoaPods or Cartage. It's surprising, but if you look at the statistics, CocoaPods have not dwindled. Actually, since SPM was released, CocoaPods has still been uh, growing and growing. But my recommendation is to use Swift Package Manager whenever possible. First off, it's the default that Apple gives us, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but uh, it doesn't have to be the right thing, as you'll see in this talk, that there's a lot of things we could do different. I think SPM is actually very useful. Uh, for a couple of reasons, my favorites are the fact that it forces you to modularize your application, and that means it will force you to have better boundaries between different features and different APIs. And I think it's really valuable because it's easy, very easy to write code without thinking about data modeling, but when you have to be explicit about what's public, what's internal, and what's private, that forces you to make the right choices and spend a little bit more time thinking about what makes sense and what doesn't. It also will lead to better API for testing because the less public interface we have, the less tests we have to route, and uh, the tests will be more maintainable in the long run. And I would push it to the limit. So if I use SPM for organization, I won't have almost no, like I basically won't have PBX project uh, files other than the root file. And I will do that by creating a module called app feature in my uh, SPM definition, and I will just embed everything into that. So then the PBX project file is simply just a host for that, for that one thing. That means that every merge conflict that you had to deal in the past, it's pretty much gone, and that's really nice. It also forces you to modularize by feature, which is something that I have been a fan of for over a decade, I know some people like to organize code by role, so like view models together, views together, models together, especially in Java world, that's also some, apparently something that's uh, popular. I think that's a mistake because when I have to change view, I usually have to change the model as well, so I would have to jump across the whole uh, file system. So the SPM approach is really nice. It will also make it more possible to use Swift previews and preview apps, which I'm going to mention. Um, if you don't modularize, your Swift previews probably won't work. So definitely SPM is my default. And the thing that people forget oftentimes is that package Swift is a normal Swift file outside of the fact that it's sandboxed, so you cannot access external things. But because it's normal Swift, we can add conveniences for ourselves. So if you don't like some of the API like myself, I don't like repeating myself, I have this extension, for example, single target library. And I just write the name once rather than the, the default with uh, Swift is have to duplicate it every time. And the same with the dependencies. I have a set of common dependencies that pretty much all my frameworks use. I automate it. I don't write it for every definition. It just makes no sense. So definitely leverage that fact. With build tools, there are really three standard ones which most of you probably use like Swiftland and Swift Format by JP and by Nick Lockwood. And the reason for those tools is simple. 
if I'm sending a PR for code review, the last thing I want to know is this doesn't follow our style. This is a waste of time for the reviewer and for myself. If there is a style, I don't really care. I could not care less. Make the tools automated for me. Just make it match whatever the team decided because consistency is key. Sorcery is something I wrote. I, I just hate repeating my code over and over again. So that's why I would use it. The thing with SwiftLint that I don't see utilized as much as I would like to in some of the projects that I worked on is it supports custom rules. And I see people sometimes add two or three rules, things like don't use HTTP, use HTTPS, but I really like to push it. So if I'm using a project with TCA, one of the common issues that a lot of developers do is when they use view stores, the view store implementation in TCA internally remove duplicates, but people forget about it, so they, uh, they chain remove duplicates at the end. That's just performance cost. So I write custom rules for everything. I have projects that have over 30 custom SwiftLint rules, and I would highly encourage you to write your own. Because if something comes up in code review over and over again, it should be automated. It should just not be something that humans have to write. So definitely would leverage that. With Sorcery, it's the same story. A lot of people that actually use Sorcery use the bundle template that I provide with it. But that's not really where the power comes in. Like, that's useful for mocking and stuff. But write your own templates. Like, there's a lot of templates that companies use uh, for their own architecture. Like, for, for example, Airbnb scans all their frameworks, which is in thousands, and finds classes conforming to a specific protocol and then auto-registers us in the system. Macros cannot do it, Sorcery can. The same with example here, when I have enum with associated values, I cannot use that to case iterable for the UI, but I can use Sorcery to generate a kind enum, which is basically a sibling of my original enum that I can use for building custom UI. So definitely leverage that. Sorcery has uh, automatic daemon mode, so it's really easy to write it. And there's Sorcery Pro you could use uh, to get even easier um, workflow. The way we integrate those build tools matter a lot. So some people would integrate Sorcery as a build phase. And even though it's my tool, and I like when it's running in projects, I, I would highly discourage that because the third-party tools that we integrate, they don't actually have to run every time. And especially if you do incremental builds, you will pay the same cost uh, so Apple optimizes your incremental build, but the external tools will not know that cache and it will have to rerun the same. So for example, running a couple of tools at the New York Times took six, six seconds per run, including incre incrementals, and I would run two to 400 times per day. That's my like, iteration change. 90% of the time, I did not need to run those tools. And it added to hours over time. I actually added for the company, when we had 30 engineers, it added to nine hours wasted every single day just running third-party tools we didn't need to run. So my recommendation is to do it as a pre-commit script. I have an article where I show you exactly how you could script it. And this is much more convenient, and it's going to save you a lot of time. When we look at bugs and debugging, there's a couple of areas. So the bug reporting, avoiding leaks pre preemptively, creating debug settings so that your QA and your engineers can put yourself in a specific scenarios that are not production, and then doing pixel perfection because our designers love to point out that this is five pixels off from the edge. So first off, bug reporting. There are two tools that I use most of the projects. It's either Instabug or Sentry. Instabug is really nice. The one beef I have with Instabug team is they said they're not planning to support Catalyst. So if you're using Catalyst, you cannot use Instabug. It's very easy to replace Instabug because what you can do is you can use Swift UI to build your custom uh, reporting uh, for Sentry. The reason why you want to be able to provide users' ability to report bugs and suggest improvements is because it will prevent bad word of mouth. You don't want to have a situation where someone writes a tweet about how your app is slow or it's hanging and it gets 500,000 impressions, which is what happened with the browser company at some point. So you want to avoid that. You want to give the user ability to easily contact you without hitting the App Store reviews. And also, it gives you more context to figure out why the book happened in the first place outside of the metadata that you're already tracking. Another thing that you should be doing is avoiding memory leaks. And the, the problem is with the tools that Apple gives us, they are not preemptive. So the tools uh, like Memory Graph Debugger, you have to think about running them. And then, let's be honest, we don't run them with every release. We don't run them very often. So what happens is, I didn't have memory leaks, user crashed, or I had many users crash because memory ran out, and then I decided, well, I'm going to use memory graph debugger, and now my diff is massive, and finding those leaks is actually very hard. So rather than doing that post-actively, 
The Lifetime Tracker, which is an open source project I built many, many years ago, it uses very simple principle for most applications. You are able to define how many classes or how many instances of a given class or, or an object can live at the maximum. For example, at the times we had uh, caching for articles. Articles were web views, so very expensive. And, but we only pre-cached up to three articles, so if there ever was a fourth article in memory, we knew we leaked one of the previous ones. So this, this tool is very simple. We just define three is the maximum, and then if ever in memory there is fourth, okay, we had a leak. And it works as you develop. It's constantly available in your application. You are working on something else. You're just navigating through your application. Boom. There's a leak. You get information, and you can find it in a much smaller div. So very useful for custom applications. Uh, the open source version just uses numbers. But for a lot of clients, what I did is I bound it to the data model so I can write rules against the data model. So if in the database I had 10 websites and in memory I had 12 website controllers, it means something was leaking. So I would recommend either doing a custom one or you can reach out to me and I'll build it for you. Another tool that I built a while ago that most people don't realize because I, I release too much stuff is automatic settings. So every single app I have worked on over the years needed some kind of way to have debug settings. So being able to override my authentication so that I don't have to log in or change the, the paywall counter so that the times we only could uh, read five articles before logging in. But as a tester, as an engineer, I want to test up to 20. I just don't want to log in. Or I want to change animation speed, stuff like that, right? We, we all have apps that do this stuff. I don't want to write that UI. I don't care about the beauty of that UI. It's not something that users actually use. It's something that it's only used internally. So I wrote this simple, simple framework, automatic settings. And the code you see on the left is basically the code you'll uh, get to execute. And then all the UI on the right is fully automated. There is like zero code that you had to write to get the UI for it. So Sorcery will generate a prop, like a property grid implementation that lets you mutate all the data which means when I integrated that at the times, it removed 5,000 lines of custom UI code, and it made it so that if the product team or engineers want to expose extra controls, they simply define the data, and they're done with it. They build the project, the UI is already there. So massive amount of uh, code being saved, and you don't have to maintain this, you don't have to test it, it's all, all done for you, very conveniently. Another thing that often happens is, I personally work in Simulator a lot, Probably like 90% of the time I work in the simulator, I only use device if I'm using specific APIs, like if I'm working in with AR kit or I need some graphic stuff, then I would use the device. Most of the time I try to avoid it because of the iteration cycle. I don't want to wait for my device to launch and do all this stuff. So I only run on device every now and then to check performance and, and things like that. So simulator that Apple gives us is, is great, but there is a rocket sim but, uh, written by Antoine. It's a premium tool, but it's not very expensive. And it gives you a lot of control. It gives you uh, overrides for the st standard system stuff, so you can change the dynamic type, you can reduce motion, all this stuff. But it also Sherlock's a couple of other apps that existed in the past. For example, there was this thing called Uber Layer, where you could compare your designs against the, the actual designer mock. So this does really well because it integrates it at the simulator level. So you can copy the image from Figma, and then you can compose it on top of your simulator, perfectly aligned, and then you can just see if it matches or not. It also does something that's so trivial and used to be available in the system, which is network link conditioner that for some reason, it's no longer the, the, the default. Uh, you can simulate airplane mode without having to turn off network on your Mac, which is the Stack Overflow answer when people ask, how do I test airplane mode? Like, just, just disconnect your Mac. That's not very convenient when I want to read Stack Overflow as I develop. So consider buying this. It also su supports screen recordings, but unlike the standard QuickTime or um, simulator one, you can add a lot of conveniences, like you can add the device bezels, so it looks much nicer. Highly recommend it. It's really nice. And when we talk about iteration speed, we're talking about time it takes from the moment I change my code to the moment I can verify if my code actually makes sense or it didn't fix what I thought it did. 
So I want to shorten that loop. Like I want as, as quick look, uh, loop as possible because it makes me connected to my code, especially if I'm working on UI, UX. This is really something I don't want to wait and wait and wait. This used to be much faster in Objective-C. It's getting better in Swift nowadays, but you probably remember how, how slow it is um, or how slow it was until recently. It's getting better. But there are three things that I use to make it even faster for my own projects and client projects. The first one is building playbook-style interfaces. And playbook is basically this idea that you take all your screens in your application in different permutations. So if I have an authentication screen, I can be logged in, I can be logged out, I can have errors because my password is different, and I generate this one single app that hosts all of those variants. So I can very quickly review if the design makes sense, if I didn't break something, if I'm changing something fundamental in my design system, I want to quickly verify that actually works very well. And so there's two frameworks that are very useful for that. One is Playbook iOS and the other is Prefire. The same idea, the biggest difference is Prefire uses sorcery and also uses your existing Swift UI previews. So if you already use Swift UI previews, it will take it and generate all the snapshots tests for you, fully automated using sorcery, and it will generate this view also without having to register anything. Whereas Playbook, it's a little more mature. There's more contributors to Playbook, but it requires you to create your own scenarios. So it's a little more work on your side to integrate it. But definitely worth checking out. It also makes your designers a lot happier because you can just send them this playbook application and they run it and they can quickly verify that everything matches. The same with QA. Another thing that I often do is because I organize with SPM, this enables the idea of preview apps. And a preview app is basically a target that only has a single file, which is my host. And what I do is I import the module that I care about to test or iterate over and I just launch it. And that means that I only have to rebuild that target and it's chilled targets, but I no longer have to rebuild my whole application. So if I'm in a focus mode working on one piece of the application, like for example, with the browser company, there is this idea of home, which is like your downloads, your archive, all that stuff. I had a preview app and I could launch immediately into home view without having to build my sidebar, without having to build um, a bunch of other features we had because the code base was really big. So it's a very, very quick uh, way of actually jumping straight into a feature. You can also set yourself up with a custom version of that feature. What I often do is when I'm hosting my module, I will add a top bar, and each item in a top bar will be a different variant. So I'll be logged in, I'll be logged out, I'll be on a different profile, and that makes it much faster to develop. But it's still not as fast as it could be because anyone with experience with Flutter or React or any kind of web stack, to be honest, uses hot reloading. This is like a standard, has been a standard for years. It was even available back in iOS, not iOS, back in Cocoa development many years ago when Xcode had edit and run button, Xcode 3 or something very old, probably older than most of us. Um, the idea of hot reloading is very simple. I save, I do changes in my file, I save it, it should just update. Very simple. Apparently, something Apple have never heard of. I have no idea why. Um, so, in 2014, after Apple released Playgrounds, I built Objective-C Playgrounds. And that was already supporting hot reloading in Objective-C and Swift using DICE, which was like a framework that was used back then. Nowadays, I use this thing called Injection for Xcode. And two years ago, I think it was two years ago, I open sourced this thing called Inject, which is a very simple framework that enables hot reloading across all of Apple's stacks. So you can do Swift UI, UIKit, AppKit, you name it. And what's really cool about it, the integration is really simple because it becomes a no-op in production. So as you develop, you get hot reloading capabilities, and it works with value types and everything else. So it's much more stable than it used to in the past. And you don't have to remove that integration code because in, in release mode, it's a no-op. So what you can do is you work on your application, just do normal stuff, and you realize something is wrong, like the title is wrong or the layout seems off, rather than having to restart your application or go and find a preview or go and find a snapshot, you just change your code and you save the file. And this is an example of it. You just save the file and it's updated. Regardless where you were, even if you got one day, like you, you know how hard it is to reproduce bugs related to data. Sometimes you just get weird data and you cannot, can never reproduce it again. So 
as long as you're working on simulator and you're developing, you can always modify the code. You never have to remove it. It's extremely useful. And once you start using hot reloading, it's really hard to go back. I've been using this technology for 10 years, so it is very stable. It saved me a lot of money and a lot of time. Let's talk about testing. Testing is something I'm a big proponent on. Uh, I think we don't do enough testing in mobile yet. On a lot of uh, other stacks, it's more mature. I think a lot of people think that testing is not worth it. I think that the reason a lot of people think testing is not worth it is because they use anti-patterns and they create tests that are not maintainable. And I think that if you do testing and you have a small team, you will actually benefit more than a big team does. Because with big companies, when I work with Fortune 500, they have dedica dedicated QA teams. So they have people that will make sure that before we release this application to App Store, it's actually solid. If I'm working alone or I only have a few people, it's on to, it falls on to me and other engineers to make sure that we didn't screw up and we are all humans and we will screw up. So I, I want to avoid having to have that burden on me to make sure I didn't break something 10 levels down the road in the hierarchy when I was working on the first screen. So there are three main things that I use. First off, snapshot testing, which is a point-free library that I really like. It replaces Facebook snapshot tests that were popular a few years ago and uh, Facebook, as usual, archived and didn't support. It's multi-platform, including Linux. It supports all the frameworks you, you can use at Apple, but it also supports testing not just screenshots, which is really nice. What you can do, for example, if you use GRDB, which is SQLite um, wrapper, one of the best open source libraries out there, by the way, if you want to deal with SQLite, it has support for snapshotting migration. So you can write very easily, write tests that verify that your data, database migration worked correctly. So highly encourage that you use it. It's really easy to use. The, the tests themselves are really readable. Really, there's nothing bad about it other than your repo size will grow because a lot of images in repo just means larger uh, repository. Fortunately, it shouldn't be a problem for most of us. I mean, I'm biased because I have a good network, but I hope, I hope you guys do too. Uh, another tool, which is actually my, I think, most popular project is called Difference. And I wrote this when I was creating Sorcery because I hated how when you have complex objects in your XCT assert equal, and you try to ask Xcode to verify that this object matches this object, it will just do what it does here on the screenshot. Throw me a wall of text printing all the, vari all the variables for each object and hope that I somehow have a scanner in my eyes and I can figure out what's wrong between those two walls. That's not really how I work. I might be getting older. It's really just not the way TDD should work. TDD should have very quick iteration cycles. So if my test fails, I immediately want to know what's wrong so I can go and fix the implementation. So I created this. This is just using mirror. And what it displays is at the bottom, which even with very complex objects, dictionaries, arrays, all that stuff, it will find the exact property that's different. And here it says that the stomach carcinoma value is different. And I, I don't need to scan anything. I just look at the bottom of the stack. OK, this is wrong. I need to go and change my implementation. So it's really uh, convenient. There is another library that you might explore, which does a similar thing. Uh, it's newer, which is uh, point-free uh, log dump. And uh, that does something similar, different uh, presentation. I like this because I wrote it. I've been using it for a long time. I'm biased, sorry. Um, for testing, if you do UI testing, that's the hardest testing you can do, in theory at least. I highly encourage that you use page object pattern. If you want to learn more, just search for page object pattern. There's plenty of resources for it. In short, rather than doing your UI tests, like when you write UI tests, you don't want to look at the elements and search for labels and all this stuff. You want to write a higher order abstraction on top of each screen you have. So for example, if I have authentication screen, I will define my object first. I will hide all the implementation detail, how that is actually designed in that screen. And then I would create chainable interface. So when I write my tests, my tests read like this, so I can read, OK, so what I wanted to test here is the login has valid credentials. I highly recommend using snake case for XC tests because when you have a lot of tests, it just reads much more read it's much, just much easier to read. I know it's not standard Apple way, but I have to mention that it just works better. I have thousands of tests in my apps. Um, so I, I can read my tests, and it's like, OK, so I create authentication screen, I type in my email, my password, tab login, and I expect it to succeed. 
very readable. Do I know how the design looks? I don't. The benefit of that is I have hundreds of those tests. If I ever change the authentication screen layout, I don't have to touch any of my tests. I just go to my page object pattern implementation, and I change those details there. All my tests still pass. And that's the key, because with TDD, you go red, green, refactor. But every time you change implementation detail, if your user stories didn't change, they should never go red. So that's why you want to do this. You don't want to modify your tests. If you have to modify your tests every time you change implementation, that's an anti-pattern, and that's why you probably don't like writing tests. So highly discourage getting to that point. And there are three other libraries that I really like, which is Pulse, Proximan, and SwiftUI Introspect. So Pulse is a, it's a library, it's a framework, and there's also a Mac application, which is like a premium. It's still in beta, so it's, you can still access it for free. But it's basically a logging system. And it was designed for networking, but it's actually a general purpose. So you can integrate it with your own uh, models, with your own logs, and it looks amazing. It's one of the better looking uh, community things I have seen, uh, much better than most of my tools because I am absolutely terrible at design. And it's multi-platform, supports or app, Apple platforms. It doesn't support Linux, but it doesn't really matter. It's built with SwiftUI as well. And you can use it for free. So basically, when you integrate Pulse, you can always pop in the console in your application, and then you can get the premium app for Mac so you can connect remotely. It's very convenient, very powerful. Proximan is much better for networking. And it's kind of amazing. I used Charles in the past, but Proximan is really good. Like I, when I was researching my video course, I was looking at like the different tools and what they can do. And you know, everything can do SSL proxying. Like Charles and Proximan, they do that. But with Proximan, you can do stuff like filtering. You can gr do GraphQL debugging. So I can basically breakpoint on a specific GraphQL request and then react to, to different params. I can even write JavaScript logic to reply with different fake files. And what you can do, because it's man in the middle, so you can do that. Most of your requests hit real server. You get real data. But if you want to simulate a very specific scenario, you can say, well, if this argument was passed, I actually want to fail, or I want to provide this weird, weird data that's malformed just to verify my application handles it. It's really, really powerful. It also looks very nice. So highly recommend uh, trying this tool if you do any networking in your application, even if it's offline first. And the last tool that uh, I, a framework really that I always use in the last, I think, three years is SwiftUI Introspect. As much as I like SwiftUI, and for me, SwiftUI is the default for most things I do, the API is just very limited. There's a lot of things missing. If anyone tried to use Video Player in SwiftUI, you know that people at Apple don't often think about what you want to use. And so there's like almost no API you can use. So the, the thing here is you can use the uh, view representable, but if you use view representable, you have to re replace the whole implementation. So it's not like you can use view representable and just tweak one thing. You have to rewrite the whole video player. Whereas if you use introspect, it gives you access to underlying components. So the way SwiftUI works is the SwiftUI definitions get changed into labels, uh, AV video player controllers, all those different things. And rather than having to rewrite everything from scratch, you can just do, OK, well, for this iOS version, because it changes across versions, which is always a, a pain for us to maintain, but for this thing, if I have a navigation view, I actually want to change the background color for my bar. And you can do it with two lines of code rather than having to replicate everything and maintain everything. So this is a very useful project. I, I found it extremely useful when I was developing Sorcery Pro because I needed API that Apple just didn't give me, even though it was available in UIKit. So I would use that in every project for, for now. It also doesn't use private API, so you don't have to worry about being rejected. And recently, they added ability to specify iOS versions, so you can be more explicit, because there might be a difference in how the Swift UI definition is represented on iOS 15 versus iOS 16. Uh, so this deals with that. And the thing is, the Swift UI ver version is bound to the system. So if you test it on that version of the system and it works, it's not going to break. You don't have to worry about that. So there is very little risk in using something like this. So in summary, I always say don't count on Apple. Don't count on the defaults. We have amazing community. There have been a ton of tools and frameworks created over the last 12, 14 years. 
was actually 16 years, 2008, when I started with the private, private Apple uh, SDK in Sigwin. So 16 years almost, and there's just so much good stuff you can use. If you want to search for more tools, there's this repo called Awesome iOS that lists hundreds of different things you could be using, different variants of the same tools, completely different approaches. I would highly encourage you to try new approaches. I know we are often stuck in the rut and we have a workflow that we feel works for us and we don't really want to get out of comfort zone. And some tools might not work for you, some tools might not be maintainable in the long run. I have rules that I follow for my tools that they never cancer is. You can always easily remove them, stuff like that. But even if one tool works, it could save you hours per week. Hours of time is a lot of time you could be spending with your family, you could be enjoying your other passions and not stuck in, your, in front of your Mac and being annoyed that things don't work. I write about this stuff on my blog and Twitter sometimes, mostly blog, and I'm going to launch a video course soon so you can follow me there. And uh, I'm available for consulting. That's pretty much all I do right now, which is help teams be more efficient. And those are my contact information. And I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Christophe. So uh, we got uh, some questions. The most specific one is about your, um, uh, your Swiftlin rules. Um, do you, are, you, are they open source so people can grab them and get inspired or use them? Uh, they're not open source because they're project specific. I mean, they're pretty simple. Uh, I, I might share some after uh, when I get my laptop. Didn't take it with me here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I try to, like, the, the thing is, people use defaults for Sorcery, for Swift uh, SwiftLint, stuff like that. But it really sh those tools really shine when you take your project needs. And the way I build those rules is, is really simple. If I see the same comment in my PRs, it means it should be automated. Like, if it's the same pattern over and over again, like, if you have to point out, oh, this is not how we do things, you might not deprecate the API because for some reason the, it might still need be, uh, be needed, but you can write a swift lint rule so that the next time it happens, you don't have to be the bad guy. That's the thing. Like, the linters become the bad guy. I don't need to be the one saying, well, this doesn't follow our best practices. I can just make it. As a team, we decided this is best practice, and the bot is the bad, bad thing, not me. We have a question from Woody. Uh, what's the future of sorcery with uh, Swift macros? Uh, I'm not worried. Uh, sorcery just uh, enabled Linux support. There's a lot of workflows that sorcery offer that macros simply cannot do. Like the example I mentioned with Airbnb, when they use sorcery to discover types conforming to a protocol across the whole code base, you cannot do that with macros. There's also a bunch of limitations and bugs with macros right now. One of the limitations is due to the fact that macros use visitor pattern, which is how Swift syntax parses your code. And you have to be really careful, because with visitor pattern, what that means is if you have your type definition and you're building a macro that's uh, supposed to know all the variables or all the functions, and you do any extension outside of that definition, that will not be available to your macro and there will be no compile warnings or errors. You simply won't have the code. So be very careful. That's not the story with Sorcery, because Sorcery, before it runs, it builds the whole project AST. So if I have a file with 20 different file extensions, it will co concatenate everything. And when you run your template, you have access to everything at once. With Swift macros, it forces you to have this massive file, which is something like in the browser company we had uh, TCA architecture, and some of our state objects were actually using 10, 20 extension files. So with macros, that would be problematic. Um, a bit of topic question is about uh, the tools you make. You know, uh, there is much, um, many issues in uh, uh, many ecosystems, uh, open source ecosystems, like uh, libraries made by um, for JavaScript that actually. Uh, are the basics for or um, most or uh, like all uh, JavaScript packages, and those maintainers are not getting paid at all, or uh, just a few, yeah. and they actually they create the modern web. And how do relate to those issues as uh, as a maintainer? Um, oh yeah, this is uh, this is a real problem. So maintaining projects, it's work like it's a full time job in itself. I have over twenty projects. I rely on community. A lot of people contributed to those tools, which is also something that's really important because I don't want projects 
to go under. If I ever get hit by a bus, so you will live. There's now, I think, around 100 uh, people that contributed. There's uh, probably like 15 people having maintainer access so they can release new versions. The guy that's working on it right now, the Linux support, amazing. He's doing an amazing job working on it. Free sponsorship from people doesn't really work in my experience. When I had GitHub sponsors, in the 10 years I was open sourcing, I got like total $500. So that's, that's very far from the <laughs> amount of hours I spent for community stuff. Uh, when I did Sorcery Pro, as a, it's a paid application which costs 20 bucks, and it adds custom editor for Sorcery. It also adds Xcode extension, which lets you do a lot of really cool stuff. You can watch on my website. Um, I made around $30,000 from that, so that's, that's not bad. For I, I worked on it a month over time, but obviously Sorcery, I worked for years. Um, Pulse is doing something similar, where you have the default open source thing free, and you can buy uh, an application that's like, empowering you to do even more. So that's one model of doing it. I recently got sponsored by Bumble, so they, they gave me uh, $1,000 uh, per month. Uh, Airbnb sponsors, I think $100 per month for, uh, Airbnb has been doing this for a long time. Um, it's not a massive amount of money, but it's decent. I started blogging, doing premium articles as a way to monetize some of that and also have more time for doing this. So if anyone wants to support the kind of open source work I'm doing, uh, my blog has premium articles for people that uh, pay, I think it's $10 per month uh, or $9 or something like that if you subscribe for a year and you get access to premium content, you can understand how to write your own tools, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, in my experience, you have to give something if you want to get something from people, unfortunately. Even though when the tools save you, like sorcery saves a lot of time for people. But I understand not everyone can support it. Um, so yeah, I, I generally like give incentive. Like with my blog, people that pay premium get access to like a lot of interesting stuff, especially like around TCA. I got a lot of people interested in my writing because I changed, like I affected how TCA works now. Um, so yeah, try to find ways to monetize your uh, writing or ideas without restricting like the main content as well. It's important for me. I want this stuff to be free. Okay, nice. Um, very specific question as well. Um, how does Pulse uh, compare to the um, US log feature? US what, sorry? The OS log. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, much more nice. It's much more nicer. Um, the other thing is it's, it, it's designed for networking, so you get a lot of custom UI with a lot of details. It's just like better designed for those kind of stuff. OS log is too general purpose, so that that's obviously just gonna be like very raw logs instead of having this nice and uh, polished experience. Uh, yeah. Performance wise, I mean OS log is gonna be faster okay. because it's using static strings yeah, and sure. stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you.